Hello, I'm Shahid Abari and I'm a fellow of the Forum for Philosophy at LSE Philosophy. Welcome to this event on resilience. We're delighted to have you and we're looking forward to hearing from you too. It's rather tricky running an event on resilience in our current moment where many of us, I think, feel under considerable duress. Uh, perhaps resilience is the last thing that you want to be thinking about if you feel worn down from homeschooling and all the anxiety of multiple lockdowns during this pandemic. Or perhaps you might feel that you truly understand what resilience is, having lived through this last year. Whatever the case, resilience is one of those words that has been in the air in recent years, emerging in popular psychology, newspaper op-eds and even in job descriptions. So in this event, we have a team of experts from different disciplines who might help us understand what we mean by resilience and how we should be thinking about it. We'll be talking together for about 45 minutes and then we'll hand over to you for questions. If you have a question, please do type them into the Q&A box just underneath our screen as we go along and they'll get sent to me and I'll do my best to pose them to our panel on your behalf. So let me introduce you to our panel. David Bather Woods. David is a senior teaching fellow in the Department of Philosophy at Warwick University. His research focuses on the 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, especially his pessimism and his moral and political philosophy. And he's written widely about Schopenhauer in relationship to ideas of happiness, compassion and boredom. David Wesley. Hello. Hello, David. David Wesley is the head of psychology at Middlesex University. He has specialist interests in counselling and psychological therapies and the psychology of mental health. And he's written widely on creativity and psychopathology, startle reaction and immersive training systems for emergency response. I don't know what those are, but I'm very keen to find out. Hello, David. Hello. And Mark Neoclus is a professor in the Critique of Political Economy at Brunel University in their Department of Social and Political Sciences. His interests are in political thought and political imagination, especially concerning bodies, monstrosity, subjectivity and death. Hi, Mark. Hello. And Serene Kader. She's the J. Newman Professor in Philosophy of Culture at City University of New York. And her interests lie in classical philosophy, feminist philosophy and global politics. And she is currently writing about women's empowerment and transnational feminist ethics. Hello, Serene. Hi, Shahida. Hello, everyone, welcome. Okay, that's a, a long introduction. There's so many of us, but let's get started. I want to start with you, David Bather Woods, if I can. Where and how do ideas of re resilience emerge in the philosophical traditions that you research? So I think when thinking of what we mean by resilience now, um, many people will think of the Stoic school of philosophy as a good starting point. So the Stoics were, well, active in for five centuries, just in the first couple of centuries at the end, um, at the beginning of the um, Christian era. And um, they relate to resilience insofar as they're known for a philosophy that's geared towards helping people develop um, a, a way of handling adversity. And the way that they do that is by dividing the world into two kinds of things. First, the things that are up to us, the things that are within our control, which is more or less everything that's external to us, that th those are the things that are, sorry, that, that are not up to us. And the things that are really up to us, which are our, our judgments and our responses to those things. And the thought is that Nothing is good and bad in itself, but it's our judgments and our responses that create the kinds of unnecessary suffering and anxiety. And if we can think of the external things in the correct way, we can, we can save ourselves quite a lot of anguish. So that's um, perhaps could be thought of as a kind of resilience insofar as it's about dealing with misfortune and adversity when it comes. Now, um, there are lots of objections we could raise about Stoicism and, and the philosopher who I study, Schopenhauer, had a few of them. And um, one of them relates to the pessimism you mentioned when you introduced me. Schopenhauer, I mean, these Greek schools were after a, a good life, uh, which they usually thought of as some kind of happy life. And Schopenhauer doesn't think there's such a thing as a good life. He certainly doesn't think there's such a thing as a happy life overall. So he, he almost thinks that these schools are starting off from a contradiction in terms that they're aspiring to something that, that can't be achieved, even with this kind of um, self-control that the Stoics think of. 
Um, but that's the schools, these kind of Hellenistic schools, these Greek schools in general. One of the more specific criticisms of Stoicism that Schopenhauer has is that the Stoic kind of wants to have things um, without wanting to have them, wants to have a kind of detachment from things so that if it loses some of these external things like health or, or wealth, it can carry on unperturbed. And apart from the fact that that might not be even considered resilience, resilience might be not being unperturbed or being able to recuperate when we have been perturbed. Um, Schopenhauer thinks that that's not really psychologically possible. Once we start to take pleasure in life and the world, if, if we can at all, um, we start to become reliant on it. He, he, he seems to think actually that it's not that stoicism is too extreme, it's that it's too moderate. <laughs> that there's he even says there's no middle ground between desire and the negation of desire. And so for him, he prefers kind of uh, ascetic saints rather than stoic sages, people who renounce the world rather than try to find happiness in the world. A better philosopher, if I can mention one more, would be somebody who comes immediately after Schopenhauer, which is uh, Nietzsche. And uh, Nietzsche, like Schopenhauer, believed that we are inevitably and going to encounter suffering in life. But unlike Schopenhauer, he didn't think that, that was necessarily an objection to life. In fact, Nietzsche thought that perhaps suffering and the way we incorporate suffering into our lives and grow from it um, could actually add value to life. It could be what bonds us to life and wants us to uh, make us affirm life. Um, and so Nietzsche is probably most famous, although not a lot of people know that he said this. He said, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. It's kind of a cliche that he coined. <laughs> um, and I don't know whether the panelists will disagree or that's a good motto for resilience or not, but um, there's something I think to that in that um, for, for Nietzsche, often the things that are most valuable are things that were obstacles that we've managed to overcome. Whether or not we feel happy about it in the end, perhaps the process of growth itself uh, is something valuable. That, that's super helpful to, to hear you outline that. And also, What Doesn't Kill Me, Make Me Strong is also the name of a song by Kelly Clarkson, which I didn't <laughs> realize, obviously stolen from Nietzsche, of course. I <laughs> yeah. mean, I, I mean that that is a question for all of us. I think to think about whether that 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 slogan that that axiom is a desirable. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. But the the thing I want to ask you about is how realistic the Stoic approach to to life is. Is it is it a fantasy of invulnerability, even when in the neo stoicism of Nietzsche, or, or or is it is it a is it a principle a, a practical principle for life? I waver on this, if I'm honest. I find it a very seductive way of thinking about the world because it makes things seem so neat. You can just figure out the things that are external and not up to us and forget about them, not worry about those, and just concentrate on the things that you can control. And you can kind of understand why one of the most famous Stoics, Epictetus, was originally a, a, a slave. And, and you can understand why uh, being able to focus your attention on the things that are still within your control would be a kind of uh, therapeutic thought. Whether it's realistic, um, I, I, as I say, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure whether you can humanly become this detached from things or whether you should even want to become detached from them. So one good point of contrast between um, Nietzsche and the Stoics is that one of Nietzsche's other famous doctrines is the idea of amor fati or the, the love of fate. Now, the Stoics thought we should take on fate as something um, that we, as it were, take in our stride or acquiesce in. Um, whereas Nietzsche thought that we should love our fate. We should affirm it with our most positive uh, emotion. And um, apart from the fact that it may be that forming those kinds of attachments to the things that happen to us might cause us to find more value in life. Again, it might be a more um, realistic <laughs> way of, of looking at the world that we are passionate beings and we can't extirpate those passions as the Stoics um, as opposed to have thought, um, but we need to actually cultivate them and, and actually need to, um, you know, guide them in a way that uh, adds value to life. That that's such a that feels like a very resonant thing to say in in our current moment when lots of us are undergoing adversity and feel under duress. That when you have very feel like you have very little control over the forces around you, you you might be able to exercise some control over how you respond and learn from or or, or develop from that. It's I, I wonder if this is a Nietzschean moment and if um, I mean Nietzsche himself was a resilient person. So is this a Nietzschean yeah. moment? Yeah, I mean. One of the words that I guess we haven't used or wouldn't think of using would be uh, convalescence. So 
Nietzsche was a perpetual convalescent. He was always getting ill with stomach upsets, with, you know, pretty much blindness, he were, you know, and, and migraines and things, hardly ever able to work sometimes. And he took that um, a state of convalescence to be a, a metaphor for the way that he had to overcome Schopenhauerian pessimism about the world, in that he had to kind of overcome this kind of spiritual poison of thinking that the world is a, is a terrible place. And so um, in the sense that we are... <laughs> convalescing yes i mean both literally and, and and metaphorically then it could be described as a a, a nietzsche moment so, um, nietzsche seemed to think that we should choose the philosophies that will help best promote life which mm. by which he meant an, an affirmation of life at at a time of his lowest spiritual and physical ebb that's when he turned away from the, the schopenhauerian philosophy because he thought it wasn't the philosophy that was going to get him through the last thing he wanted to be told when life was pretty terrible for him was that life was terrible so it could be uh, thought of that way, I suppose. Yeah, we all have to run to our Nietzsche. Um, let me draw our, our, our other speakers in, Mark, David and, and Serene. I wonder if you have any thoughts to, to David's very effective and, and clear setting up the philosophical context there. And th this idea that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Is that a desirable axiom to live by? D does anybody want to come in? Well, I, I, I might just, if it's okay, Shahida, um, yeah, I course. might just, um, cause, cause that, that sort of makes me think about a concept, uh, uh known as post-traumatic growth, the idea, well, wh whatever, uh, doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Um, and well, there, there isn't huge and convincing evidence from a psychological viewpoint for that, but, but actually what I like about, uh, that sort of idea and, and Nietzsche's perspective on this is that um, it it sort of runs against one of the really damaging stereotypes that people hold about what resilience is. They they hold this idea that resilience is being bulletproof, that resilience is not suffering, um, and 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 that that's not the case. In, in fact, you know that that not suffering a, a sort of really kind of twisted stoicism is is a method of coping. Uh, possibly one that will send you to an early grave, but it's uh, it's it's not the same as resilience, um, which which is really about coming back, uh, you know, in the face of adversity. We, so, so the suffering is important, and and we've got to acknowledge that. Other, otherwise, we can't cope with what's there. I really want to draw that out when, when we talk to you a bit more about that psychological context. I think that'd be really helpful to know. S Serena, Mark, did you want to come in? Did you have thoughts? Well, oh, can I go? Serene, you go first. Um, no, I just wanted to say that I, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that the Nietzschean point is about that, like that what doesn't kill you will make you stronger if you have a certain attitude toward it, right? Like, um, and I think one, he's not saying that it's just a statement of fact that everything you face affront that is adverse in your life is going to make you um, stronger. It could actually destroy you. And then I think separate from the point from Nietzsche, because um, I'm, you know, I'm going to say some pretty critical things about resilience when we get to my point. I think we all know from our experience that taken as a statement of fact that it's clearly false that everything that doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? Like sometimes things do break us down. Um, and you know, even thinking about the image of like resilience as a rubber band, right? Like you can break the rubber band so that it won't bounce back, right? Like if you stretch it too thin, it will lose its elasticity. So I'll say some more critical stuff later, but I just want to plant in people's heads that even though we're so used to hearing this, that it's become a lyric in a pop song, if we just look at our experiences, it's true that many of us often have experiences that, you know, break the rubber band or make it inelastic instead of making us bounce back. I feel I, like the rubber band is going to come back again and again. And it's one of those metaphors that will last forever. David, quickly, and then I get Mark in. Yeah, very quickly. I would say that um, I think that's true, that it's not empirically true, that um, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. I think that Nietzsche would recognize that distinction too, though. He, at one point in the climax of his genealogy of morality, he says that it's not suffering that human beings um, can't cope with, it's meaningless suffering. And, and so um, he thinks that there is a distinction between the kinds of suffering that can be made meaningful by growing from them and the kinds of suffering that are just trauma or just baggage and that really will detract from the value of life. Yeah. Mark, let's draw you in very quickly before I turn to oh, David Wesley. Well, just very quickly, I mean, I, I am going to make some critical comments about resilience. I guess 
to, to think about the, the idea that whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Um, whether or not that's empirically true or not, the, the question is, would we want to call, why would we want to call that resilience? It sounds to me like if we were looking for a word to describe that, it would be resurgence. And I think that's the problem with a lot of resilience discourse is that it wants to attach resilience to every every you know, good thing that it encounters. So, oh, it hasn't killed you. It's made you stronger. That's good. That's resilience. Well, maybe it's resurgence. Hmm. Um, you know, Anna Zing at the end of, uh, in her book on the mushroom at the end of the world makes a point that, you know, when a forest recovers from deforestation, we should be calling it resurgence, not resilience. That's interesting. This seems like a good moment to get our psychologist in because I think David Wesley is going to have some definitions he wants to clarify, and uh, I, I think, and and I, I I want to come to you now, David, because in some ways we're going to be relying on you as our psychologist and as our practitioner in some sense. H how is resilience being understood in psychology circles? Oh well, gosh, uh, um, I hate to speak for all of psychology because, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, like every discipline, every concept is contested. But uh, I, I'll try and kind of bring some some footholds uh, that we can use here. So, so first of all, uh, I would think of resilience as an outcome rather than a thing that people have. And I actually think it's it's quite harmful when people start thinking about it as as a um, as a personal quality. So uh, psychologists started using the words uh, word resilience to, to talk about the fact that some people uh, recovered better than expected in you know through traumatic exposure or exposure to chronic stress uh, in some longitudinal studies so so resilience was tended to be used in that sense a trajectory of recovery and that's why i'm interested in it because i, I think that studying when people do better than uh, we could hope for in the context of uh, you know uh, experiencing trauma, uh, uh, being marginalized, depressed uh, under circumstances of cr chronic stress, uh, tell us something important about how we work to support those individuals. Uh, I think it's, it's definitely not a, a personal quality uh, resilience. It's, it's not a trait. Some people have tried to conceptualize it that way, but that, that hasn't been a particularly successful project. Um, and I think it's best understood as an interaction, but it's it's a very complex interaction. And it's an interaction of person, uh, situation, the physical and social environment. And it's and it's not like one of those mixing paint interactions where you mix up different uh, tones and, and and get some new tone from that. It's it's actually an interaction that that develops as it goes along. It unfolds. So so there's a very non-linear relationship between events. And, and people's recovery or, or some kind of resilient responding. Uh, uh, so that means that the, the whole idea is of resilience, uh, you mentioned at the start in job descriptions, in the curriculum, uh, it's, it's really misplaced. It's misplaced because um, that's, that's only a small part of the interaction, an interaction that's not that well understood. Uh, I, I, I work, uh, you know, hands up, I, I, I have been involved in resilience training. And, um, and part of that really is trying to bust some of the myths so people don't internalize this idea that they should be resilient. If they're feeling bad, they're somehow doing something wrong because they're not uh, resilient enough. And, and when I do that training, I'm very keen to kind of conceptualize resilience or, or whatever term might might be appropriate as a team sport, as something that happens between people and not just as an individual thing. And we can look at uh, the things that go on in our biology. We can look, as, as Stoics would, at how we, um, you know, think about and conceptualize the world around us. But there's also a, a really important piece about how we relate to others and others relate to us and the opportunities that we have to do that. I think you're on mute, 
Un up. I'm unmuting myself. How sure. um, unprofessional of me. Um, no, that's really interesting to hear. And I, I the um, because I think one of the the critiques that might be leveled is that you know resilience is a symptom of our our, our neoliberal individualistic culture where we're all trying to be you know kind of tool ourselves up to succeed in in life and job markets and 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 everything. But you understand it not as an individual quality but as a as a team quality. I I take your point that it's not a a, a, a quality in fact but an outcome but I'm interested to know how you measure resilience then are there are there particular ways in which you, we can get a measure of a person's resilience or their or their the resilience of their environment uh, well gosh uh, just strayed into quite a, a sort of a tricky and controversial area I, oh, I'm sorry I, I think well no 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 it's fine I, I, I mean I'm really happy to talk about it um, it's I don't think because I don't think resilience is a thing. I, I don't think you can measure that thing. If if you're if you're looking at how people recover or, or get back to a, a sort of previous state of well-being from difficult times, that, then you define it in that particular outcome how you might measure it. Uh, I guess you can measure some of the things that make. Uh, resilience more likely. And although I don't think it's a personal quality, uh, there are some things people can do to improve their chances of enjoying a resilient outcome if the social conditions are favorable to do so. Uh, so you could measure things like um, uh, a responsiveness of the nervous system, if you want to look at it at a, a physiological level, or you could, um, uh, you could look at uh, more sort of uh, conceptual measures, things of optimism, that, that kind of stuff. Or you could even look at how people feel about uh, the amount of social support that they have available to them. So, th so there's a whole set of indices that you can use. I'm quite interested in measuring the responsiveness of a nervous system. Do you push somebody's thumb back as far as it will go? And what does that mean when you measure someone's oh, nervous gosh. system? Right. Oh, well, yes. Uh, so, so what, what I'm talking about is measuring um, the, the functioning of your autonomic nervous system. So, so the autonomic nervous system is, is the thing that's responsible for our stress response throughout the body, getting us ready for action, hyping us up, uh, heart rate starts going, adrenaline gets pumped into the stomach, uh, muscles tense and all of those things. And, uh, and of course, that's a very useful thing to be able to do in, in, in times when we're under demand. But if that goes on for too long, that's harmful. So part of our autonomic nervous system is able to soothe us, calm us down, actually sort of uh, reduce the feeling of, of upset and worry throughout the body. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so measuring that function, normally I would measure it through heart rate variability, which is just about the gaps between heartbeats, uh, the ability of your nervous system to slow you down. Because contrary to most people's belief, um, uh, heart shouldn't be too regular. They shouldn't be like a metronome. And so little variations between the heartbeats is a good indicator that we're able to calm ourselves down. That, that, that's not necessarily a trait in people that that kind of nervous system reactivity uh, is heavily influenced by events. Yeah, I, I'm just asking that question because I mean, I think like lots of people, I want to know how resilient I am. I don't want to do something that doesn't kill me <laughs> and makes me stronger. I just want, I kind of want to know what, if there is a kind of physiological way I know that I'm resilient, but I think that speaks to the uh, the interest in resilience. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you as a psychologist, as, you, as you've seen this word emerge in popular culture more generally in job descriptions we're talking about, what do you make of, of why this, is, this, this, this term has, has surfaced in the way that it has and the purchase it, it seems to have on our, on, on our popular consciousness? that I could be a resilient person. Yeah, well, I, I think this is wandering away from the psychology a bit, but you know, I do wonder if it's just convenient for, for a number of people to, to talk about resilience and make it someone else's responsibility. Um, and, and from my point of view, that's not just harmful because people are exerting power in that way, which is clearly uh, a harmful aspect of it, but because it actually promotes power in a way that precisely makes resilient outcomes less likely yeah. because it, it promotes self-critical dialogues. Uh, uh, you know, sort of almost uh, if, you know, 
almost the opposite of uh, stoicism in, in terms of how people think about themselves and it encourages people uh, to to yeah internalize self-criticism i'm not resilient enough i'm not resilient yes. enough i'm not resilient enough i would cope better if i could just become more resilient yeah that's interesting that the cult of resilience is producing a kind of anti the, the having an the, the opposite effect in lots of ways let me draw in david bather woods serena and mark as well do, do you have comments and, and thoughts for, for david's attempt to kind of redefine resilience there mark come on in i think you're muted oh there you are well, it wasn't to redefine, it was just, um, you know, thinking about um, appearing in, in job descriptions now is, indicates, well, for me, the extent of the problem that we face, right, which is that it has become the kind of category that one cannot refuse. In other words, it's a bit like flexibility or positivity. You know, it's like, what are you going to do if you're sitting in a job interview and someone says, you know, would you describe yourself as resilient? You're not going to say, no, <laughs> in the same way that you, you know, are you flexible? Well, of course I'm flexible. Um, and it, it's, it's an indication, I think, of how, in one sense, how banal all, a lot of the debate has become about resilience. Serene? Yeah, I, um, I agree that we should be worried about the job descriptions thing, um, and maybe also for another reason. So some um, feminist scholars like Robin James and Angela McRobbie have written a lot about how once resilience becomes a desirable quality in the marketplace, um, then it requires people to perform um, having experienced trauma in order to present themselves as having the positive attribute. So. Um, instead of just saying I'm flexible or, you know, I have X degree, like normal marketplace attributes, even if they also have neoliberal um, sort of connotations, this one, like the structure of resilience is something very bad has happened to me and I have been able to come back from that thing. So proving that you are resilient may often mean having to publicly relive your trauma in front of other people. Um, and that could be harmful to people in a variety of different ways. I mean, one is just the very reliving of the trauma, but also if you're from a group that has experienced trauma for some kind of you know, structural reason, or maybe even not, you may need to package your trauma um, in a way that's palatable to the person who wants to hire you for being resilient. So I feel like one example of this that we hear all the time is how refugees craft their narratives um, in order to receive asylum, for example, to present the receiving country as the source of only good things that have happened in their lives and the country that they have left as the source of all the bad things. Even if it's true, for example, as many like women asylum seekers have experienced, you know, that they experience sexual assault when they're crossing the border into the receive, like the receiving country, they may have to, you know, omit that from their narrative. So, it, it's not just that you have to perform trauma in order to demonstrate that you're resilient, but you may have to perform a kind of trauma that actually obscures the real trauma that you went through. And that could also harm you psychologically and contribute to like the triumphalist discourses of um, the new country or the person who's trying to hire you and so on. Well David, David Wesley, I wonder, I mean, I, I don't want to pile in on this, but I, I sort of wonder whether this is a question about what the relationship is between resilience and, and trauma and vulnerability, that does it have room for those? It, it, does it have to be a triumphal narrative or can it allow for those things? Oh, yeah, it's, it, it certainly can. I, I mean, I, I think that's actually part of the way uh, that I, I, I see resilience. It's, it's not about I mentioned earlier, not about being bulletproof or, or putting things in a box, nor should it be about uh, people having to to relive trauma, as as Serene said. I, I think I think part of the problem is that that when people are using resilience in job descriptions or in the curriculum, they they are actually talking about something rather different, which is probably coping with stress. And and so so as Mark suggests, we're using the term resilience everywhere but that's, that, that's why i'm sort of almost working backwards I, i'm interested in you know what makes crappy things less crappy sorry, I'm just, sorry <laughs> you're allowed to, but, not radio okay. four you're allowed <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, uh, because that's that's useful information to have 
I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the question about reliving trauma is a really difficult one. I think I'd, we should come back to that. Let me come to you, though, Mark, um, so we can move our, our conversation uh, on again, because um, I know you take a, a critical perspective on, on resilience, however we're defining it, and, and you place it in a broader political context. So tell me how you're detecting the notion of resilience being used in this political context. Yeah, OK. Um, well, <clears throat> I think to really get to grips with how resilience is used in the wider political sense, we need to ask the, the kind of broader question first, which is really the kind of question that um, anyone interested in a philosophical world ask you, which is how does an idea come to dominate the intellectual landscape? Because that's clearly what has happened with resilience. And, and I think I, I've got a little telling detail here. Um, the British Library catalog offers us 14 books with resilience in the title before 1982. Since 1982, there are over, there are five and a half thousand books published with resilience in the title. And of those, around about 4,000 have been published since 2013. And one of the observations to make about um, the, the earlier books is that the, the ones before 82 are really largely about kind of systems Right. ecological systems were uh, the resilience of soil okay whereas now the books are kind of simultaneously deeply political but also deeply personal so as much as we kind of might enjoy ourselves sort of thinking about you know the stoics or Schopenhauer or Nietzsche and you know what where, whether when they said this did are they really talking about resilience I think you know what we need to be doing is asking what on earth has happened in our world to make everyone so obsessed with this idea. Um, and I think given the historical context of this shift, it's, it's difficult not to note two things about this, this rapid rise of the resilience agenda. I think the first thing is that it coincides with the rise and intensification of the political problem of neoliberalism, so that we find institutions, financial institutions, governments, you know, the World Bank, the IMF are constantly informing us that the, their main aim is the financial, the, the resilience of the financial systems and thus the global order of capitalism. But the other thing that they're constantly insisting is that the world's population, and in particular the world's poor, have to learn how to be more resilient. In other words, you know, to put it crudely, people in poverty are not meant, are not, are not, should not expect to be helped by having some basic needs satisfied or having their uh, levels of exploitation removed or reduced. But they should be trained to be resilient. They should learn how to be resilient. The second thing is that this rise in resilience coincides with the overwhelming obsession our society now has with. And everywhere we look in the debate about security now, we find the kind of mantra of resilience over and over again. So national security doctrines are now replete with the idea of resilience. And I think what's gone on in, in, in security circles is that, it, is that it, security has become obsessed with or focused on the idea of uh, emergency planning. The idea of having to deal with the next emergency, the disaster to come, the terror that's about to strike us. And so it wants us to be constantly preparing for the next disaster, the next, the next shock, next emergency. And in that way, our kind of personal resilience is expected to be bound up with the resilience of the system as a whole, right? And if you like, the security of the system. In other words, what I, what I think is that resilience is a kind of a, a deeply political agenda in that it kind of, it wants to, it wants us to be trained and it wants us to, to go back to David's point, of view, train ourselves um, to be responsible for the shocks to the system that are about to come. And I'm using that term responsible because in a sense, I think part of the resilience agenda is precisely a responsabilization of, of our ability to bounce back from the shocks, to deal with the shocks. In other words, I, I kind of, 
it, it's, it's political because the message that we get is that if you can't deal with the world and all of the insecurities it generates, and if, if you, you can't cope with the next crisis, then it's your fault for lacking resilience, despite what David has just said about, you know, not imposing on individuals. So in that sense, I, I kind of, you know, my position here is that resilience is really, it's a pacifying agenda. Right? It's about our pacification. It's designed to make us submit to the very systems that are damaging us and the systems that are kind of making us miserable. Um, and it's, it's stopping us thinking about how we might be with others in different ways. I, I hear your skepticism, Mark, but I, I, I'm also mindful of David's um, criteria of re resilience being not individual, but being about a, a community and, and, a, and a set of resources, which, yeah. which might be more palatable to us than the, the dominant one of resilience at the moment or the, the popular culture idea of resilience. But I, I, I hear your skepticism and yet I can't help but think, well, why wouldn't I want my financial systems to be robust? Why wouldn't I want my health, global health system to work? I, why wouldn't I want these things to be resilient, these systems to be resilient? Why wouldn't yeah, I want but, that? But what's, in, but what's interesting there is that you, could, you found it very easy to describe your desires without actually using the category resilience, right? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, you know, one of my, one, one of, a person who I regard as possibly my best friend who I've never met <laughs> and who actually, whose name I can't remember, it was the mayor of a, a small Italian town, Bugliano. Um, and last summer, I, the summer of 2020, I, in the middle of a pandemic, <clears throat> he announced that the term resilience is banned from its use in town. And people who used it, citizens of Bugliano who used the term resilience were to be fined 25 euros. <laughs> and under the notice, as part of the notice he put on the, on the town hall uh, notice board, it was citizens should learn how to use a thesaurus. Right. right. We have a language where we can talk about our needs or desires or wants. Resilience doesn't have to be part of it. Let's get some comments in for, for, for Mark. Uh, David, Bay the Woods. Yeah, I, I feel I want to play devil's advocate and say something for folk psychology of still describing people as resilient and that, that being attractive. I, I, I um, even though taking into account, you know, all these psychological reasons why to describe it as an outcome and so on, um, I, I wonder whether, for instance, of course, it would be unjust to make someone be responsible for managing the misery that's been inflicted on them by an unjust system. But um, if I'm to be Schopenhauerian about this, I would say that even if we had a perfectly just system, we may still be miserable. <laughs> it may just be part of uh, human existence. And it may be therapeutic to think that um, it is, we, you know, we can be responsible, we can be with it, um, in control of managing our, um, our suffering of that kind, let's say, the kind that hasn't been unjustly forced, foisted on us by, by an unjust system. So, I, and in those senses, I feel like, um, you know, with all the reasons for accepting that, um, that we should think of resilience as a outcome when studying it, I can see why people would be, still remain attracted uh, to the idea that resilience is something they can cultivate as a personal trait and virtue and resilience is, um, um, so a way of being in control. I mean, I can see that it wouldn't just be attractive in reference to somebody else's ends, but in, in terms of our own ends. It feels like it's going to be an unpopular opinion, but I'm just playing <laughs> devil's advocate there. No, I, I can see that. I can see the attractions too. And I imagine our, some of our listeners and, and viewers might feel the same, but I want to move the conversation on yet again um, before we turn to the audience. Um, we started, Serene, with a circle of Stoic philosophers and, and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, <clears throat> and we keep widening the lens and we'll do so again with you. So tell me how ideas of resilience are being used in international development contexts. Yeah, um... It's, if it's okay, before I do, I just want to make one quick comment about the folk psychology of resilience point, um, which is when you asked Mark Shahida, like, 
you know, don't I want my financial systems to be robust and so on. Um, and I agree with Mark's reply that you don't need the language of resilience to, um, to describe that. I also just wanna say something about what the language of resilience imports. And that is this state of constant insecurity, right? Like why does resilience rise to prominence for us in this time as um, the attribute that we all wanna focus on cultivating? Well, part of the reason is that we are in a state of constant crisis and we need to, we don't want to end up adopting a moral or politi political vocabulary that makes us unable to diagnose the source of crisis and instead kind of normalizes the, you know, life will always be a crisis, right? That there will always be a pandemic, there will always be a climate disaster, there will always be a financial um, crisis. When we know all of these things are human created crises. So, the fact that we live in this area or in this in this era where crisis is you know is everywhere it's not a coincidence that that era is the era when resilience becomes the the moral vocabulary that's politically popular to answer your question about um resilience in in development contexts so resilience is um understood in development contexts and has been for maybe about seven or eight years now um, as the capacity of individuals or communities to adapt to or recover from some kind of adversity or disaster. So before I say a little bit more about my personal gloss on that, I just want to point out something that's um, that might be kind of a point of contrast between my view and, and David. So David was saying we need to stop kind of understanding resilience only as an individual attribute. I just wanna point out that I think um, in policy context and certainly in international development, it's already widely understood as a community attribute. And then kind of the dark side of the story that I wanna tell is that making it into a community attribute doesn't stop it from hurting people. So um, one of the, um, the things that so the main, not, I mean, there are many stories like this you can tell, but one of the main funds of resilience in impoverished communities is effectively women's unpaid labor. And there has been a conversation about this going on um, kind of since the structural adjustment programs of the 1980s. Um, if you don't know what those are, um, you can go look them up. But the short version is that um, <laughs> uh, in, you know, in the post-war era, um, and especially in like starting in the 1970s and 80s, um, international development institutions basically imposed very severe austerity measures on the poor countries um, who had become highly indebted to private banks. They basically said, we'll bail you um, out of your debt to these private banks if um, you agree to these austerity conditions on your loans. So basically, you know, as one might often expect from austerity conditions, um, there were big cuts to social services <laughs> um, as a result. And in the, starting in the 1980s, there starts to be this great ob observation in development contexts that about what was then called survival, which basically said, oh, that women had this incredible power to um, fill the gaps that were left by cuts in social spending. So to make it really concrete, right? Like you cut your health care. It's not like people stop getting sick. Um, somebody has to take care of the sick people. Um, the people who are socially assigned to be caregivers are women. And so I think part of what got noted in that historical time was, oh, look, um, societies have these untapped funds of resilience for society. But what are those untapped funds? It's the labor of women. Um, and basically, I think this discourse gets echoed. So they call, but crazily kind of, they called this women's empowerment, right? Like this, the idea was, oh, now women can make up for all of these deficits in social spending. And that's why it like will empower them for us to make us do that work more. So this connection between a social gap and individual responsibility like has a long history and development discourse. It feels a little like resilience is just the new name for it. And to sort of close the loop um, about the idea of, um, of making resilience into a community attribute, I just wanna point out that making resilience into a community attribute doesn't on its own like serve the ends of social justice that we would want to, right? Like you can say that, I mean, women's unpaid labor is an attribute of a community, but um, like saying that the community is more resilient because women are doing all this unpaid work 
well, it doesn't um, undo the fact that a certain group of people is basically being worked to the point of exhaustion in order to protect this resource that's talked about as belonging to the community. So I think in addition to thinking about whether um, individuals or communities should be thought of as resilient, I think it's important to think about who within communities is tasked with doing the labor of resilience. I think that's such a, a helpful perspective. And I, I wonder, perhaps this strays a little bit, but I wonder if we, if we, if we don't want to convert a community attribute which has come about because of an inequality or a, a shortfall in some way into uh into resilience it, it, what happens to that do we i mean do we what, what i'm trying to say here is that is there is there a kind of redemptive gesture in trying to to look at a community and say you are resilient you've recovered from this and look how re remarkable you are or or is that absolutely diminishing to, to to is that I mean what do you do with that experience if you don't say well look this this is an enormous strength to have have acquired I th that's quite a hard question but I, I wonder what you do basically yeah I think I mean it's kind of a double-edged sword really like once you start um praising someone for being resilient unless that praise is accompanied with some promise to do something about the source of the vulnerability um, and in this case, both the source of the crisis and the underlying like gender inequality that has been there to some extent before the crisis, then it becomes this empty kind of praise and something that, and we have seen this in development contexts, it's not just empty, it's a, to go to Mark's uh, word that Mark used, right, like, it's a form of responsibilizing praise, right? Like you are so great because you are so resilient, yeah. like keep up the good work. <laughs> um, of course, um, and none of this is to deny, and I think this is a point that Mark and um, David Wesley have made, or not Mark, that, that both Davids have made actually, <laughs> that like under non-ideal conditions, look, you might need to be resilient in order to get by, but making resilience the main goal of development policy um, is clearly missing some, <laughs> some other important moral goals and shifting responsibility both onto individuals and to yeah. members of vulnerable groups. Yeah, we're, we're good. That, that's incredibly interesting. I'm learning so much. Uh, we're going to head to the audience questions in a moment, and I'm going to remind the audience that they can enter their questions in the Q&A section of the screen and they will be fed to me. We've got loads of questions, so that's really wonderful. But just, I think, to, to pick up on this idea of resilience as a marketable attribute which has come up a, f a few times i wonder what we do about that has that, are we are we i mean are, are we entirely skeptical uh, that resilience has been co-opted as a marketable attribute in workplaces in international development or or, or is there something that we can hold on to with with, with an idea of resilience here? I mean, David Wesley, you're the obvious person to come to here about resilience becoming a marketable attribute. Can we redeem it, I'm asking, really? Um, I think so, and in a particular way. And it, it, it relates to Serene's crit uh, 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 critique of um, the, the resilience concept in communities and where that comes from. Uh, because uh, one of the things I should have said, it's not a property of the individual. It's not a property of communities either. It's it's what the, the transactions uh, between individuals and uh, communities and other meaningful social structures that they they belong to. So so for for me, uh, re resilience and uh, we we might need to find another word because uh, resilience is uh, everyone hates just it. Gone. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but um, uh, re resilience is, if, if we want to help people uh, enjoy um, resilient outcomes, then then it's it's about setting helpful, constructive, socially just rules for those transactions between individuals and communities, and 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 I think that is a place for intervention, and and there there are examples of that. Yeah. Mark, can I get you to come in here? Because I, I know you've been thinking about the marketization of resilience and this causes you a headache too. Um, actually, no, it doesn't cause me a headache. No? It makes me tart a lot, <laughs> but that's a different thing. Um, so actually, I'm not sure I can connect. I want to try and connect that question to oh, well, something maybe you've else got that's some been going on serene. in my head. Okay. Well, no, I mean, I think there's something going on here. It's just that... that 
question of who is it being marketed to? And I think there's a, there's a tension taking place and it's a tension that's probably a response to some of the criticisms that have been made about resilience, which is people saying, well, it's not about the individual, it's about, so we've had two different terms here, it's about teams and it's about communities. I mean, I think this is a kind of a way of purporting to not be about responsibilizing individuals. It's also playing quite heavily, I think, on the, a, lot, a strong part of resilience's origin, which is in systems theory, um, which is a way of saying, well, it's not about individuals, it's about the resilience of the system, or as we've had, resilience of the community, the resilience of the team. The problem is that, um, and this I think goes back to the original problem with systems theory as it became a kind of philosophical issue, um, which is, you know, should we even be thinking about human collectives through the lens of systems, right? And the, the philosophical argument against doing that was very clear. It's like, well, actually you need other ways of thinking about human collectives that address precisely some of the issues that have come up in our conversation. So for example, address the, the question of, let's say, justice, yeah? But if you, if you, if you don't do that, if you just say, well, it's, a, you know, human collectives are systems like any other systems, then you kind of, you're, you're, you're kind of missing something quite important, right? Which is we want to think about our collectives, not simply as resilient, but as something else, or we want them to be something else. In other words, going back to your question to me, we don't want them to just be robust. We want them to be just, let's say, yes. right? Um, and so if you go back to the, you know, the, the way resilience is used when it's, when it's used to think about ecological systems, you can get sentences like this, right? And I'll give you this because I know, I can guarantee that none of you will have read this sentence, <laughs> okay? None of the listeners viewers will have read this sentence what I is know it that because it's a sentence that comes from an article on the ecology of plankton planktonic <laughs> atlantic cod you're right, right i haven't read it you haven't read it forgive me i have saved you the trouble but here it goes right quote cannibalism is an investment in the ecological resilience of the population right okay and of course it is because in certain moments cannibalism for a, for a certain system for a certain species might make perfect sense in terms of its overall resilience. But that's I, I not the kind of way in which we want to be thinking about human yeah. collectives, right? Yeah, I, I can't I, I can't go with you with the cannibalism so far, but I'm finding it hard to follow. But I can't, I, Mark, I can't help but think that I want my systems, my society to be both just and resilient. I mean, I, maybe I think that right now because I'm in the, living in a global pandemic that I want my health system to be just and equal and fairly distributed, but I also want it to be strong. And maybe that strong is mm. not a synonym for resilience, but let me, yeah, let but me you, turn but to you. But the... you thought that 20 years ago before yeah, the term resilience had come into your brain, right? But so... I think, yeah, but maybe they're, they're doing the same work, those two words. Let me turn to the audience. I have to launch a defense for resilience because I think our audience might be invested in it to some degree. I think it's, you know, it's in the air and that's why I want us to have a conversation about it and I want us to give it some space. So let me turn to them. Um, we've got questions um from Sasha Cohen Shabot and Sasha's oh sorry Sarah Cohen Shabot Sarah's question would be would it be right to say that Stoics principles actually prevent political and social change being that all that we need is to be content with things we cannot change i.e I accept accept my slaveness now this this might be a question for you David but I think it is also a broader question about whether resilience occludes structural change um but David Batherwood do you have a go at it first for us yeah, um, I think that's a fair question because it might seem that way. And I, and I indicate myself that Epictetus might have adopted Stoicism because, you know, for his slave origins. But at the same time, Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic and he was the emperor of the Roman Empire, quite the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, I think it's a fair question because it seems like it's a philosophy of acquiescence. It's a philosophy of imperturbability. Um, now, the thing is, though, I don't think it necessarily follows that we would be apolitical if we were Stoics because judging thing, something to be unjust and responding appropriately is within our control and is something that we could 
respond with. The outcome is not within our control. So if it goes wrongly, then we have to deal with that. Uh, if it if it produces you know other outcomes, if it goes very well, we have to treat it still as something that is a, a gift that could be taken away, as Epictetus would put it. So I think Stoicism is compatible with action, and I presented it as very individualistic, but there is a whole you know discussion among the Stoics about the way um, one relates to others as a Stoic. But so I think uh, no, it's it's not it's not necessarily an apathetic philosophy, but it but it is still cautious about success. I think that's the point. <laughs> Serene, you were nodding. Did you did you want to come in? No, you're okay. You're okay with that. There's a question from Daphid Lewis uh, to to Mark. Has the rise of resilience in politics come about due to the increased issues? Um, I think this is to everybody: climate change, biodiversity loss, overpopulation facing humanity. So, is that what accounts for 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 resilience? Uh, uh, our, our ecological crisis. Mark, did you want to have a go or does anybody want to have a go? Um, I don't I don't think it has that that single origin in, in that sense. But I do think there's an interesting history in relation to the way in which eco about resilience. Um, but um, I think it's I think it, uh, a wider problem than that, which is um, our the, the way in which we are being constantly prepared or readied for whatever disaster failure emergency attack mm. um and i think that tells us that's what that's what is quite telling about our, our contemporary world mm. David Wesley, can I ask you about this? Just because I'm, I'm wondering whether, when you meet with patients or, or, or with the, with, with pe or, you, or your clients, are you, are, are they, are they thinking about their, their trauma, their suffering in that context, in, in a kind, in a broader context beyond their individual situations about, about the ecological crisis, for instance. Uh, well, I, I, I don't do uh, therapy work with, with individual clients. I, I do work with uh, groups and sometimes individuals uh, in relation to, to resilience type stuff. Um, your specific question about people sort of worrying about broader, uh, social, uh, broader issues facing humanity, well, I, I guess it's possible that that would... Um, the, the, those issues could um, increase anyone's anxiety or stress. I, I wouldn't necessarily see it as something that was challenging people's resilience as an extra burden, uh, particularly. Let's move on to the next question. This is from Santos. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce your name. Santos Vasco. I, I mispronounce your middle name. I'm not I'm not going to try it. Can we can we think about resilience in terms of society in general and specifically to social or, or health systems? I mean, that seems like a particularly pertinent question right now. And Serene, I wonder if I can come to you about this. Can we think about resilience in terms of society in general and specifically to social or health systems? And is there a, is there a, a, a global perspective here? Yeah, um, I think we definitely can think about resilience in relation to um, global health systems, I think, and um, country level ones too. I think that the way that um, you would do it would be to think about how, um, you know, the ability of individuals to and communities to respond to crisis depends partly on what kinds of investments in their health are made. Um, I'm not 100% sure that like, you know, as people have seen, I'm not 100% sure that that's how we should be thinking about it. I think we could think about it that way. I think if we do think about it that way, then I would, um, I would urge an approach that um, thinks about um, the inequalities and in resilience that are expected from different groups of people. So a more justice oriented um, resilience based approach to health would look at like who is doing the work of propping society up in times of crisis and like do those people then need special investments in their mm. um, health care and well-being and I think it would also um, but I think beyond that not so there was one project that I um, liked and looked at for example a development project that focused on um, women who were 
political change makers um, in local communities. And they were often um, vulnerable to a lot of violence as a result of speaking out about the issues that they were speaking out on. Um, the, the intervention that I thought was really interesting um, was doing work to um, you know, provide mental health support basically for these women in poor countries who were essentially experiencing threats of death and, you know, and physical loss of safety all the time. But until then development institutions had just been like, oh, we'll empower them to do that work without seeing the, that that work also produced vulnerability that um, needed mm -hmm. some kind of social support. So I would just say like a justice oriented way to do resilience um, in a health systems setting would focus on um, bringing resources to people who are doing the labor that holds society together. And then I would say that it can't stop there. I mean, we have to look at the underlying health inequities and, and social inequities that make that the case. Um, yeah. So it's not just about keeping propping up the woman to do all of the work that keeps society going. Like we need to look at the um, at the distribution of that work and allocate healthcare in a way that does that. So in the particular case of healthcare in the global South, we might start by um, stop, you know, by making bigger um, investments in public health infrastructure. So women have to make up with, um, make up with it less frequently with unpaid labor. Yeah. That, that makes such sense to me that, you know, just because you're coping in, in tremendously adverse situations, does not mean you will cope forever. It means precisely that one should target your their resources, your resources at that source. That the the resilience isn't the end game. It's uh, the, maybe the beginning of a conversation. But I wonder, just a quick question before I go back to the audience: that whether in your in your work you're finding that that term resilience is including terms like vulnerability. Has it has it is vulnerability falling out of the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, in one of your um, kind of notes about what you might ask us, Shahida, you were saying like, is there another word we could use? Yeah. And to me, I mean, I think we should talk about reducing vulnerability. And one of the things that, I mean, and of course, and I think this is where, you know, points like um, David um, Bather Woods's make more sense. Of course, like we can't remove vulnerability from the human condition, right? Like all of us will have our heart broken at some time. I mean, like, I'm not saying that that type of vulnerability should be removed. On the other hand, um, we need to talk about like reducing people's vulnerability to, extreme poverty, to climate disaster, to sexual assault. We have to talk about reducing those vulnerabilities. And what I don't like about the term, or one of the things I don't like about the term resilience, which, and I've lodged similar critiques of the term empowerment in my own work, is that it suggests that the solution um, is, um, is to be found in the individual, right? Like the difference between talking about just vulnerability, um, or I mean, if you don't want to talk about the individual, the community affected, right? Like if, we just talk about vulnerability, then it's open ended what kinds of strategies we might use to reduce that vulnerability, including for like the case of the of the poor in the global south. Well, one thing we could do to reduce their vulnerability is to change the structure of the global economy. But if we just talk about resilience as the solution to their vulnerability, then it starts a lot to look a lot more like they should be like it's fed a complete that this type of vulnerability is going to continue and they should be doing something um to stop themselves from being so vulnerable or refuse yeah. or to like reduce the effects of the vulnerability yeah um we've got a question from ivo jakovsky i'm so sorry if i'm butchering people's names um it's for you david but i david i also want to ask you david wesley about about the place of vulnerability in in resilience practice. Um, uh, this is a question for David Wesley. Thank you for your insights. What further reading or training would you advise for somebody who would like to use the concept of resilience in interaction within a team or in a workplace context? So is there further reading that might expand the understanding of resilience? Well, I, I wouldn't read anything that's got resilience in the title <laughs> for, for reasons that we, we've all been uh, discussing. Uh, uh, as soon as I heard that, I, I was thinking about, well, um, I, I think uh, uh, introducing uh, the idea of compassion into workplace contexts is, is a really good way of linking the individual to the group and not placing resilience in, in either place, especially. Um, and just off the top of my head, there's um, a compassionate workplace toolkit that was done by um, the National Forum on Health and Wellbeing uh, a few years ago now. No, not that many years ago, but 
um, it's you can Google that, and uh, and it's it's got links to to other resources as well as a a bit of other reading there. Because I, I I think acknowledging and accepting other people's suffering is a really big part of of uh, resilience or vulnerability, and it's sort of link that allows me to link to what you're asking about what Serene said mm. because um, I. Well, I, I would certainly worry about any discourse that uh, in sort of, um, you know, sort of takes away the really important notion of vulnerability and what that means. Uh, I, I think of, of yeah, I, I suppose I think of it as the op- opposite uh, si- side of the coin there. And I, I do worry that you could take a term like vulnerability and do the same with it that people have done with resilience. You could say, well, how do we reduce vulnerability? How do we... Uh, you know, how do we ensure that vulnerability is not so widespread? Um, and, um, and yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't know if words are the solution when we sort of shared a, a sort of problem about a, a prevailing uh, sort of cultural and political set of trends that, that are, yeah. well, yeah, they're, they're actually damaging resilience yeah yeah by not acknowledging what it is zeroing in on personal responsibility or the responsibility of a particular community that doesn't have many resources to uh you know make a change to be resilient yes i think i could see exactly the same or very similar problems with the the vulnerability argument when when vulnerability becomes a form of um uh, it becomes it becomes a very reductive way of, of thinking about people's agency or lack thereof. David Bather Woods, you were nodding vigorously while David Wesley was talking there, and I wondered if oh, you were, were you thinking of... Nietzsche would hate a term coming oh, becoming yeah, well, a buzzword like that. Yes. No, it's I was nodding because um, my my Schopenhauerian ears pricked up with the mention of compassion. Oh. Schopenhauer's whole ethics is based on compassion, but that was another point of contention between him and Nietzsche. Nietzsche thought that there's too much compassion in the world, which is uh, silly thing to say many people would think <laughs> looking at the world um but but that's why i was nodding because it, it links to uh to yeah. those ethics that's all yeah that that's that's very interesting actually <laughs> there's a question from alfonso diaz which i'm going to paraphrase a little bit but it's a very intriguing one and i'd be interested to hear what you think uh our first world dwellers bearing in mind all, all of our caveats about what resilience is and how uh, how all the problems we have with it but are first world dwellers less resilient than their so-called third world counterparts given their bland life for three or four generations is this a problem that we now see in the reaction or lack thereof to covid and mask wearing and so i mean i think this is a very interesting question that you know part, part of the conversation at the moment is whether um, the Western world in some way has been incapable of responding, whereas people who've had to deal with Ebola and other things are much more expert at and resilient, maybe even in dealing with a pandemic. So is there a difference between the resilience of the first world and the resilience of the so-called third world or the global south? What, what do you think? It's a tricky question, that one. I mean, Serene, I'm looking at you particularly, but I wonder uh, anybody could answer it. Um, does anyone else want to answer? <laughs> I'm so <laughs> sorry, I'm throwing it at you. <laughs> uh, I mean, I had a couple of different thoughts there. I mean, on one hand, it's obvious that people, you know, the poor in the global south have had to be more resilient across the board, right? Like you face a lot of adverse, I mean, poverty brings about a lot of adversity. Um, and surely people build up survival strategies to deal with it. On the other hand, I don't think that we should be sanguine about um, how the global South has um, dealt with COVID, for example. Um, it's pretty clear, for example, that you know the death rates are extremely high in countries that are poor and with poor healthcare infrastructure. Um, it's also the case that um, you know it's a good example of a case where they're going to be forced to be resilient whether they want to or not not just because of underlying infrastructure but because the north is buying up all of the vaccine <laughs> well it's like yeah. well then what choice do you have besides to be resilient um in terms of the specific point about mask wearing um i think it is a really interesting um thing to analyze why um, so many people in the North seem to have a, um, a problem with mask wearing, but I don't think I would attribute it to differential resilience. In fact, like 
The United States is an interesting case, and I wonder if it looks different from a European perspective, but I would say that resilience-based arguments are frequently used to justify lack of mask wearing here, right? Like we live in a culture where, I mean, it's expected that you know, life is just going to suck. That's why you don't need social services. You have to show that like you can make it in spite of how <laughs> terrible um, your life has been. So I think um, people often, the, the common argument here is I'm a tough person, like I'm going to get COVID and I'm going to be fine. So I'm not sure that I would explain the difference in mask wearing um, with regard to a lack of resilience in the North. It may even be um, an inflated sense of resilience among some Northern populations. Yeah, thank you for that. Resilience in particular, yeah. Yeah, that was a really helpful response to an extremely hard question. Um, we're we're, we're going to run out of time, thank you. Um, but let me, there's one question from Petra Surek, which might bring us back to the Stoics a little bit, David Bathewoods, I might throw it at you. Um, in general, we've been linking resilience to justice and serene to empowerment, but what about freedom, given both its Stoic roots in lack of it and its possible synonyms like resistance and resurgence? And um, this brings us back to our, our philosophy, David, so maybe that's a nice place to end. What about freedom and resilience? Yeah, that's interesting. So certainly freedom was a central concern for the Stoics, and in particular, again, <laughs> Epictetus. Um, I'm not sure about its links to what we would call um, resilience. Um, I think the idea um, that, that I suggested in the beginning is that freedom is being able to distinguish between the things that are up to you and the things that aren't up to you. So to the extent that you exercise that kind of freedom and don't um, overstretch your sense of freedom, what you do have control over and what you don't, you might have, as I say, if, if we're going to call the Stoics a, a philosophy of resilience, then you would have that kind of resilience. So knowing your limits <laughs> uh, might help um, you to, um, to deal with um, when uh, inevitably things outside of your control go wrong so there might be a link between um freedom and, and, and resilience if, if we're calling it that um in the stoics maybe yeah yeah also a hard question which you nobly had a, <laughs> a, a, a try at um, let, let me ask one last thing before i let you go just that um, ca can we can we redeem this word resilience and if not resilience what should we be thinking about very quickly mark Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I think the language of resilience is a way of getting us to not think about resilience is true opposite revolution. Revolution. <laughs> Serene, what about you? I'll go with revolution. <laughs> <laughs> You've started the revolution, it seems like, Mark. Uh, David Wesley, surely you want to redeem resilience here. Uh, I don't want to redeem it. I want to reclaim it. Reclaim um, it. And uh, there, there's um, the the uh, a psychologist who's done a great deal of work on uh, resilience. Anne Marston's got this wonderful term that she uses for resilience: ordinary magic. Ordinary. And she uses that term to to kind of refer to a human quality, not an individual quality, but a human quality of being able to to endure and overcome. Uh, uh, you know, enormous adversity doesn't mean we should accept it, and it but it does mean that we, we have the capacity to endure. I rather love that term, ordinary magic. David Bathewoods. Uh, I'm glad that David's going to reclaim it. It would have made me sound like a counter-revolutionary. <laughs> <way that was, laughs> if I could go back to a, a stoic point in an attempt to, to redeem the term. Um, I mean, we've heard a lot about um, the potential bads of resilience and, and therefore I think established that it's certainly not an unqualified good. But to return to the Stoics, he, they thought that things aren't good and bad in themselves. If there is only, if there's one good, it's wisdom. And wisdom is knowing when <laughs> to be resilient and when not to. We've had a lot of reasons when not to. Um, and hopefully <laughs> there is some wisdom for applying it when it's appropriate. Well, that's a great word for the forum. So thank you for wisdom. <laughs> thank you to Serene Kader, Mark Neoclus, David Wesley and David Baverwoods. And if you'd like to hear more from the forum, you can find details on our webpage or our blog 
blogs.lse.ac.uk forward slash the forum and you can find us on twitter too you can subscribe to our podcast and you can rifle through our archive coming up sarah fine chairs a debate about work whether we do too much of it whether it's making us unhappy and whether we should only do it four days a week that's not suitable for work on saturday the 6th of march at 11 a.m thank you again and please join me in thanking from your homes our 